Hello everybody. Here we have a inspiring lecture about trench warfare. So the focus of today will be um, kind of looking at the tactics of French war of trench French warfare, trench warfare, uh, the dangers of it, and why it developed on the Western Front. We'll look at some new weapons in the battlefield and look at the effect of them, and then look at the absurd battles of uh, Verdun and the Somme as a great way of kind of showing us the pointlessness and futility of trench warfare. So let us get started. Okay, um, so yesterday we kind of talked about um, kind of the alliances and ge geographic locations of the alliances. And when we look at this map here, uh, we can see that the allies, uh, the major allied nations are shown here, um, kind of in this greenish color here. Um, you know, you Great Britain, France, Russia, and Italy. You have minor characters like Serbia and Romania as well. And then uh, we have the central powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. Okay, and so when you look at these two sides, uh, it's pretty clear that the Allies have the advantage, mainly because the Allies can attack from uh, two fronts. So Germany, Austria, Hungary, uh, they have to defend both their borders whereas the French and the Russians and the British can put all their military on just one front. And that's obviously an advantage for those guys. Another big advantage is that the Allies have Great Britain, and Great Britain has a huge navy, and so the British Navy is able to blockade um, any kind of trade from the outside world into Germany or Austria-Hungary. Okay, So the Allies, they get to have raw materials and food brought to them from other parts of the world, whereas the Germans, Austria, Hungarians do not have that advantage. Okay, So that's obviously two big geographical advantages for the Allies. Okay, um, So let's kind of, uh, kind of get started here. Uh, Germany knows that they're at a huge disadvantage. Okay, Germany knows that um, you know, they obviously don't want to fight a two-front war. Okay. So Germany looks at their two main rivals. You have France, and Great Britain also has a army in France. Um, so you have France and Britain to the west, and you have Russia to the east. All right. And so from the German point of view, the French are the most immediate danger because the French are more organized, they're industrialized, and so they pose the greatest initial threat. Whereas the Russians are very unorganized. So the Russians are big. They're like a sledgehammer of a nation. Once they get organized, they could be a threat but the Germans are counting on the Russians being really slow to attack. So when the war starts, Germany is going to throw everything they got at the French and the British military in France and hopefully knock France out of the war and then deal with Russia. This plan is called the Schleifen Plan um, and what it has the Germans doing is basically rolling through Belgium, doing this encircling kind of maneuver uh, around Paris with the idea of once they capture Paris, the French will be forced to settle, and then the Germans can go and deal with the Russians. Okay, But unfortunately for the Germans, the Russians surprise the Germans with their speed, and the Russians are able to invade Germany almost immediately. Okay, And that creates a big problem for the Germans because they don't really have any defense on their eastern border. And so, you know, in the midst of the Schleifen Plan, if the Schleifen Plan looks like it's working, um, the Germans very well could have um, defeated the French with the Schleifen plan, uh, but the Germans are forced to send some of their armies east to meet the new Russian threat. Okay, now when the German and the Germans and the Russians do meet at the Battle of Tannenberg, uh, the Russians get just a severe beatdown. Um, you know, their army is just absolutely destroyed. Okay, um, so the Germans win a crushing victory. Okay, over the over the Russians, but the Russians serve their purpose. The Russians were basically what they were trying to do is take the pressure off their French allies. So they kind of sacrificed themselves, even though they were unprepared, and they attacked Germany. And by the Germans moving some of their troops from France over here to deal with Russia, the French and the British are able to stop the German advance into France. Okay, and once that advance is stopped, that is where we see trench warfare begin. Okay, because neither side has the advantage over the other. And so both sides decide to play defense and dig their trenches. Okay, so both sides dig their trenches, and now we very much have a defensive war where the defenders have the overwhelming advantage over the attackers. Okay, 
and basically we see just a massive amount of slaughter um, going on in, in these battles. Okay, so we'll look at some of the trenches here and get a, a better idea of why, of how that happens. So here you see some pictures of World War One. Here you can see Austria-Hungarian troops executing Serbians. This was a very nasty war. Um, here you can see some of the earlier trenches. These are very small, obviously. Um, appear to be Russian troops. Here's a more organized um, trench you can see here um, that the British soldiers are in. Um, and so anyways, here's the graphic I really wanted to kind of look at um, and, and show you a little bit about how trench warfare worked and kind of how or why it was so difficult. Here you can see our little attacking armies right here. Um, and they have to attack these trenches, okay? And there's several obstacles that they have to face, all right? Number one, the whole time they're running towards the trenches, uh, the defenders are undercover, and they have rifles, and they have machine guns, and they have artillery that are firing on the attackers. So the whole time you run towards the trenches, you're getting shot at, okay? And then once you get within, you think of a football field there, uh, once they get within 20 yards of the trenches, uh, they are met with uh, just a lot of barbed wire here, okay? And I'm sure we all know what barbed wire is, and there's a lot of it here. And the, the, the attackers have to find a way through that barbed wire, which isn't easy. And the whole time you're trying to find a way, you know, maybe through the barbed wire, the machine guns and the rifles are just tearing you apart, okay? So you have to have massive amounts of soldiers to kind of have this frontal assault to actually work for you. So anyway, so let's imagine you're lucky enough to get through the first trench. Well, then there's a second trench of defenders right here. And they have more machine guns and more troops waiting for you. And then even after that, there's a third trench right here. And so if you're an attacking um, force, you have to get through this first onslaught, second onslaught, third onslaught. And then finally, you get back here into the unprotected flank of your enemy, which is almost impossible. Okay, because the defenders have the overwhelming advantage with machine guns and barbed wire and all that stuff. And so for the attacking armies, it's really, really difficult to accomplish. All right. So here's some more pictures of some of the trenches here. You see the Germans here. You can see um, a couple things you, in this picture. You can see the barbed wire. You can see kind of the disgusting no man's land over here. The German helmets very distinguishable. These appear to be a bunch of grenades lying right here. Um, and you can see it looks like they're running along their trenches right here. Here you can see an aerial view taken by either a plane or uh, you know one of their little blimps. Here you can see the German trenches. All right, Once again you can see the lines of trenches connecting trenches that connect the trenches so reinforcements can run in to help each other's trenches. And here's a great example of what you would see if you were attacking a trench. You know, here you can basically see the top of their heads, and they have their rifles rested on the ground, and so you can see the top of their heads perhaps, but you're completely exposed, so the, the defenders have the overwhelming advantage. All right, here's some more pictures for us here. Um, so there's a lot of problems you'd face in the trenches. Um, you know, obviously, when you dig into the ground, it gets a lot wetter, a lot muddier, um, and that brings a lot of problems for some of these people. Uh, dysentery was a constant problem. Dysentery is when you drink nasty water and you basically get diarrhea and you get dehydrated and die, trench foot, then your, your feet are constantly wet, typhoid fever. So it's like I said, constant problems that these guys were facing. Picture of no man's land, bunch of dead. Um, here you can see a great example if you look at these guys' feet here. Um, you can see that they're, you know, up to water to basically like their shins, all right? And then here you would get trench foot. So your, your feet would literally kind of like peel away because of the, because of the trench foot. More pictures of trench foot there. You can see a picture in the lower right. The buddies are carrying their buddies who have trench foot. All right, really nasty stuff. All right, and let's look at some of the weapons here that made trench warfare that much more awful. Here you have a you know machine gun, British machine gun, um, and these things could fire you know a thousand bullets per minute, opposed to in the past. Uh, you know, they could shoot three bullets a minute. Now, we you know, with new technology, the ability to, to shoot and kill is, is much greater. Um, some people always ask, why are the barrels so big? It's not because there's like six little, you know, places where the bullets come out. Um, basically, there's one barrel, and then this fat barrel has a bunch of water in it, and that keeps the, uh, keeps the barrel cool so it doesn't like, you know, the metal literally doesn't melt. 
from all the bullets that are passing through. So obviously a machine gun is an incredible defensive weapon. You know, they're very cumbersome um, back then. It's not be something you carry around like you can carry around machine guns today, but back then they were, you know, very difficult, obviously, to move around. Another picture of a machine gun here. Flamethrowers were used by the British. Obviously, if you were charging an enemy trench and you got really close, and also there's flamethrowers, that would obviously be a very unwelcome uh, thing. Barbed wire, like I said, was a great way of defending. It was very difficult to get through barbed wire, and if you even if you cut it, you'd have to deal with the you know, withering fire as you were cutting the barbed wire. A lot of times what, you, what the troops would do to get through the barbed wire is that they would literally have people that would jump on the barbed wire, and then their buddies would then kind of climb over them to get over the barbed wire. So not a very good tactic, but really the only thing they could do. Um, picture of a dead German in barbed wire. Here's the Australians using their famous periscope guns, so they don't get their heads shot off, so they kept they use these periscope guns to shoot. Um, the Germans started using poison gas, uh, either in artillery shells or just big barrels that had the gas. And the idea was the gas would uh, debilitate the soldiers defending the trenches, which would allow the opposing side to um, you know, overtake the trenches. This worked a couple times, uh, but then each side started uh, you know, wearing gas masks, which allowed for them to you know, effectively defend against a gas attack. Uh, but gas attacks were very debilitating. Um, some of them killed you, others of them maybe temporarily blinded you or gave you some respiratory issues, but they were obviously, you know, very unwelcome. Here you can see a little elephant line of uh, British soldiers with bandages on their eyes from, uh, from mustard gas. Here's some animals that had mask on and such. Okay, the tank was another weapon that was developed in World War One, and it was developed strictly um, to deal with barbed wire and the trenches. The idea was these massive machines could uh, plow through the barbed wire um, and plow through the enemy trenches, and that was why it was originally developed. Unfortunately, back then, tanks were very slow, they were prone to break down, um, so they were somewhat effective, but not as effective as we would think today, knowing what we know of the tank. We, you know, we think of tanks as being very fast and very mobile and very powerful. And back then, they were very large and very cumbersome and slow, which made them easy targets on the battlefield. Okay, uh, long-range artillery was uh, an incredible advance in warfare. Uh, you know, you look how big these things are. Um, they created just colossal amounts of damage. They could shoot miles and miles away. I mean, just look at how big this this shell is right here. I mean, it's incredible when you think of how big that shell is. Um, you know, and these things would explode so loud that, you know, people would die from the explosions or the shrapnel or people would actually go insane. Um, they would basically lose their grip from reality because they would just, they couldn't handle all the loud noises and stuff like that. Um, here's a so we'll go over a couple examples of trench warfare. Uh, the British in 1916. Uh, attack the German trenches and just to kind of highlight uh, how devastating these attacks could be uh, on the first day alone the British lost 60,000 troops and of those 60,000 uh, they lost 20,000 dead pretty much in one morning of fighting and then when you look at just to compare that to us today uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan I think the United States in the past 10 years so in 10 years the Americans have lost 10,000 troops, but in one morning of fighting in trench warfare, the British lost 20,000. So it's, like I said, it's pretty hard to imagine just how bloody these battles were. Um, the Battle of Verdun is another great example of the absurdity of this war. Um, the Germans finally had this new strategy where they don't really care what they capture. They just want to kill as many of the French as they can to kind of bleed the French army. And so Verdun is just a battle where the Germans are trying to kill as many French soldiers as possible to essentially destroy the French army. So not to win the war by capturing the cities or the important places, but to win the war by just killing so many of the opposing um, soldiers. And the Battle of Verdun is one of the bloodiest battles in history. One million casualties. Okay, uh, So pretty incredible stuff. It got, to, it got, it got so bad that around 1917 we start to see troops on both sides starting to resist the absurdity of trench warfare. Uh, in fact, the French uh, in 1917, about 50 percent of the French battalions um, start to mutiny, which mutiny means you basically refuse orders. 
Um, now many of those uh, troops, uh, they would stay and protect their trenches, uh, but they refused to attack. They refused to go on these suicidal frontal assaults because they, you know, they were ineffective and they didn't want to just give their lives for nothing. Um, here you can see a picture of French soldiers actually executing one of the ringleaders of the mutinies. Okay, so the war gets really nasty later on. And this just puts it into perspective. Here I have just three battles uh, from World War I. We have the Battle of Gallipoli, which was in modern-day Turkey. You have the Battle of Verdun, which is in France, and the Battle of the Somme, which is also in France. And these are just battles within World War I. And you see the casualties are just astounding. 250,000 casualties at Gallipoli. Verdun, 975. On the Battle of the Somme, 1.2 million people um, were either killed or wounded. And if you consider that the population of the Milwaukee area, so the city of Milwaukee and all the surrounding suburbs, is around a million people, you're talking like you're talking about battles where sometimes every single person in this area would be killed or wounded. And then when you compare it to some of the wars this country's fought in the past, you know the Revolutionary War, 24,000 people, you know Vietnam War, 50, 56,000. And these are all KIA, by the way. These aren't. These don't include wounded. Um, you know, war in Iraq in that seven-year intense period. You know, it just, it's, it's incredible to see the differences and the casualties that these guys have. Um, so what we see happening here, guys, is that for the most part on the Western Front, we have what is known as a stalemate. Neither side has an advantage. Okay, neither side is strong enough to attack, and it becomes a war of attrition. Okay where the winner of the war is the, is the side that can basically withstand the most punishment, okay? Um, and really, I guess part of me thinks that um, this war might not have ended the way it did had the Americans not joined in. When the U.S. joined the war in 1917, and then when the American troops finally arrived in 1918, um, you know, just having those hundreds of thousands of extra American troops, I, kind of, I guess, kind of gave the Allies the advantage where they were able to kind of push through and actually defeat the exhausted Germans. Uh, but had the Americans not joined the war, I, I highly doubt that the French and the British would have had, you know, uh, uh, enough power to really finish this war off. Okay. So anyways, hope this kind of helped you uh, with understanding trench warfare. Feel free to watch as much as you'd like.